in hell. And, uh, you know, I kind of looked at the title, and so I, I had a title, Wrath to Hope to Glory. Wrath to Hope to Glory. So our verses that I was assigned was Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 9. So read with me. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work of patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope make us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will some one die, yet peradventure for a good man some will even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I'm going to focus on verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Father, we thank you for this time and your eternal word, the living word of the living God that lives in us. We just pray that you glorify uh, your son, the Lord Jesus, because he's worthy. And exalt all that he's done for us on Calvary's cross. And provided a perfect redemption uh, because he, he loved us and gave himself for us. So in Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Uh, I want to focus on verse 9, where it says, Much more being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved, and here's the issue, wrath through him. Uh, the doctrinal issue of the wrath of God, folks, is a doctrinal and a dispensational issue. And what I'm going to talk about today is the issue of the wrath of God being revealed, but a component of that is, is hell, the issue of eternal judgment. There are a lot of folks today that don't believe in the doctrine of hell. They don't believe hell exists. That's a real place. There's believers who have been deceived to believe that hell doesn't exist. So what we're going to do today is look at the issue of hell, but we're going to look at it in the context of the wrath of God. Because, you know, we talk about the love of God. We talk about the grace of God. We talk about the peace of God. But the issue is for lost people is the wrath of God. And I trust that everybody here knows the Lord Jesus Christ and the pardon of all your sins. So for us who are believers... I know there are people sitting here who have family members who are lost. I know that. I know there are people here that, sit, that have neighbors who they've never witnessed to about the wonderful love of the grace of God. And our responsibility is go to tell the lost about the goodness of God. That, that's the motivation for us. Now, if, you, if you're not saved, hopefully you understand some things about your eternal destiny if you don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a serious issue. Right now, as we speak, there are people we know who are living, they're in hell. Right now, they're in hell. So, the, when I go through the lesson, I want to deal with the dispensational issue to share with us our state as Gentiles. Because for me, the longer I know the grace message, the more I, I'm able to understand the Bible. I understand our predicament that we're in. That sometimes we're, we're in the dispensation of grace and and. Thank God for the dispensation of grace. Because if God hadn't have done something that was unprophesied through the Apostle Paul, well, we wouldn't have been born, number one. <laughs> but if we'd have been here at the time that his wrath was going to be revealed from heaven, that would have been something. And yet it's still to come. So I want you to come with me and go back to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. The person who preached about the issue of hell more than anybody else in the Bible is the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Mark chapter 9, he begins to go through the issue of looking out in the millennial kingdom and talking about the reality of a place uh, of eternal judgment and eternal suffering. Mark chapter 9, I'm going to start at verse number, let's start at verse 43. For if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter hard into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. 
It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God. And notice how he talks about he changed his life to the kingdom. So he's talking about a future time for where he stands. Uh, It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Come back to chapter 8, and I want you to see something. Chapter 8, Mark. Now, folks, I don't know if you understand that when the Lord Jesus Christ appears and John the Baptist is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he warns the religious leaders, he says to them, who's warned you to flee the wrath to come? There was a crisis at the time that the Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist showed up. There was a crisis in Israel's history because, as we know, and hopefully you do know, Leviticus 23, there's a timeline, a time calendar that talks about the redemption for Israel. And we know the 70th week of Daniel. So when the Lord appears, there's an issue going on about the crisis in Israel's history. And the time element, not only for their Redeemer to come, their Messiah, to come as the son of David and deliver them, but also for time for, time for God to, to deal with the world in his righteousness and deal with the world in his vengeance. So when John the Baptist says, who's wanting you to flee the wrath to come, that wrath is ready to come. Now, in Mark chapter 8, verse number, I love this verse. Verse 36, what is the profit of man if he should gain the whole world and do what? Lose his soul. The issue of losing your soul is the issue of the second death. It's the second death. It's the death of a soul. Notice verse number 37. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The issue of the soul is the issue of that person dying. And come over to Luke chapter 16. You might as well look at the verse. Luke 16. Now, I'm going to make a point here because my time is leaving. Let me say this to you, too. I said I wouldn't give you a commercial. You can't give a preacher the subject of heaven, hell, and hope. <laughs> no, really, you can't. And ask them to do it in 45 minutes. And, and he hits his clock. If you taught on hell and you taught about it dispensationally and doctrinally, that's at least eight weeks. <laughs> I, I'm serious. It is. This is serious. Let alone the issue of eternal judgment. If you've heard Pastor Jordan's tapes on eternal judgment, I think it's 12 lessons. And then you talk about hope. So the hope and, and the issue of hell and the issue of heaven, which is my message, is a doctrinal dispensational issue. So you also have to talk about rightly dividing the word of truth. But I got to do this in 35 seconds or 35, <laughs> 35 minutes, 35 minutes. So I'm going to try to condense and get to the point real quick. Amen. So the motivation to help us and appreciate not so much the issue of eternal judgment, but the issue of eternal glory. You know, they, the brother talked about it all week about the issue of suffering now, but glory in the future. And, and, and more importantly, as Gentiles, because the Lord is talking about to his earthly ministry to the nation of Israel is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when I get over here to our to, to the issue of God's original purpose in creating hell and what the nations, the Gentiles did, I hope you appreciate why we sung that song about that our Savior came. He didn't come to die for us. According to prophecy, he came to die for us according to Revelation, the mystery. And yet there's a predicament that we were in that's not just being a child of Adam, but being consigned to Satan and being the children of disobedience. And what's amazing to me, and I'm going to kind of go around because I think this is the most important thing I want to uh, emphasize, to be lost and not know you're lost. But more importantly, to be lost and to be cut off and have no hope and not even know you don't have any hope. And so because we were consigned to Satan when the Gentiles were given up, we were in a predicament that we didn't know about and couldn't get ourselves out of. That's a bad situation to be in. And the more you can then appreciate that, you can appreciate the revelation and the mystery given to Paul. How that when we didn't have any hope, God provided hope to our Savior on the basis of what the cross work really was going to accomplish. Luke chapter 16. You all know the story about the rich man of Lazarus, verse number 19. The issue of hell is a real place. There was a certain man, I'm in verse 19, a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar uh, named Lazarus who was laid at the gate of his, uh, get his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the master's table. Moreover, the dogs came and, and licked his sores, and it came to pass, and here's what I want to get to, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. 
The rich man also died and was buried. And notice the next verse. You all know the verse. In hell, he lifted up his eyes. It says, being in torments. And seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosoms. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, people will say that's a parable, and I'm not going to take time to go down to the rest of the passage, but you know that uh, Abraham says, son, remember. He points him not to the physical experience of what he was, he was experiencing about going back to his brother, but he points to the scriptures as being the issue, because God's word is true. And the thing about this issue about hell being a real place, I want you to see something now about the issue of hell. And I want to go back and I want to, I want to show the original purpose of why hell was created. Not just in Matthew's, but in other scriptures. Matthew's 25. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in the second advent. And he separates the nations. Matthew's 25, 31. And you know what? Since for time's sake, get Isaiah 14. Might as well go over there. Now, if I tell you to get one more passage and I forget, will you remind me? No, really, I'm serious, because I'll, I'll get to go on and get, and get Revelations 20, so we can just put all this in at one time. When you have people that tell you that hell is not a real place, it's not just the story of Lazarus and the rich man. It's not just the Lord Jesus Christ talking about hell. But when you see the purpose of why hell was created and why men and women who follow Satan in his lie program, then God has a place to deal with sin with his vengeance and his righteousness and his holiness and his justice. God is God. And so he has to deal with sin in a way that. The holiness of God being offended in his righteousness have to be executed. His justice is the issue here. And so God being a God of justice can't acquit the guilty. And Matthew 25, verse 31. When Lucifer sinned, verse number 31 is the context, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, that's the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes back as Israel's deliverer, their avenger, their king, and their blesser. Because when he comes back to execute the divinity covenant, he's already died on the cross of Calvary as their Passover lamb. So there's a time element involved in here. And he's going to Calvary. And I'll just say this to you too. Israel understood their historical time clock. They had it. We don't have a time calendar. We don't have a time clock. But when Peter says over there in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, those memorial feast days over there in Leviticus 23, that there were monuments of how God was dealing with Israel in terms of their redemptive calendar, four of those historical events had passed. The Lord went to Calvary. He had died on the cross of Calvary. He was buried on leaven bread. He came up from the dead with power and authority, first fruits. And so then in Leviticus 23, the next event on the time calendar was Pentecost. Those days have already been fulfilled. What didn't, wasn't fulfilled is the, the trumpets, the day of atonement, and tabernacles. Those are yet to be fulfilled. So when you're standing here and you see the Lord talk about Matthew 25, 31, that's when he comes back after fulfilling those issues in the divinity covenant. Everybody with me? You sure? <laughs> anyway. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, this is judgment of the nations and all the holy angels with him. He shall sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as the shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. And he shall say to the goats on his right hand, uh, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king, these are nations, by the way, the goat nations and sheep nations. Then shall the king, that's come him setting up his kingdom as a king and then the blesser in that millennial kingdom. Say unto them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now come on to verse 41. Now here's the goat nations. Then shall he say unto say also unto them on his left the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and what? Everlasting fire. Prepare for who? The devil and his angel. Let's come back to Isaiah 14. When Lucifer sinned, God Almighty, in order to stop the the the, the result, the re- rebellion and the um, the the disobedience of Lucifer and those angels, created 
a place of eternal judgment. And it's prophesied over here about the king of Assyria, who's going to be the Antichrist. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9. So it looks future from where Isaiah's writing his prophecy. By the way, when you get in Isaiah to Malachi, you're looking at the 70 week prophecies that's going to happen in the future. So they're not just historical books, they're books of prophecy for the remnant. Who are better going here and look at this information and understand not only the dispensation of grace, but those, those books, the Hebrews and Revelations, there were further information given them to understand their program at that time. They didn't have those books from the Lord over here. They, they were written during that time that he left to prepare them with some additional information. Verse number nine. Hell from beneath is moved. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It raises up from their thrones all kings of the nations. And by the way, if I'm struggling, it's no light up here. So my eyes kind of miss some words. So if you see them, just read them and believe what's on the page. Come over to verse number. And then you see the plan of Lucifer in um, the following verses. Verse number 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to where? Hell, the size of the pit. Now that's the bottomless pit. Come over to Revelation chapter 20. And what I'm saying here is that, folks, if you read all these verses and don't believe that hell's a real place, that it wasn't created for Adam's kind. It was created for those angelic beings. But when, and you know, when Adam sinned and he joined that plan of evil with Satan, then all his children, you and I, were destined to that place too. Not only because of our nature, but also because of our actions. We were condemned by God, Romans chapter 3. All we did were abominations to God, and then we were alienated from him. Uh, Janine and I went to our room last night, and the guy comes on because of this band that our president has on trans, transgender folk. And this guy's sitting up there with hair, but he looks like a man. But he's supposed to be a woman. I don't know what he was. Why, why, why? And he wasn't, that, he wasn't even an attractive man. He still looked like a man with hair and earrings and lip gloss. Why wouldn't God destroy that perversion? You know, I know even men and seducers going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but the, the ungodliness of mankind, the ungodliness of this world, to join with Lucifer or Satan, so the wrath of God, the Gentiles, at the time the Lord's right, are meet, they're fitted for destruction. They deserved it. We had earned it. It wasn't God being just. It was our unrighteousness. I want to tell you guys a turn. Okay, I told you. Revelation chapter 20. Second coming of Jesus Christ. Go back to chapter 19. Now, this is the second advent of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give some things about the three times that the wrath of God has been revealed. Verse number, and this is one of them, verse number 20. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet which wrought miracles before them, which had deceived them, that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped its image. These both were cast, there it is there, alive, into the lake which burnt, burned with fire and brimstone. So hell is going to be cast in a lake of fire. And the issue of the eternal judgment is the issue of the, the lake of fire. Now come down to chapter 20, verse number 3. Verse number 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him how long? A thousand years. Go down to verse number 10. And the devil that did see them, now he's led out of prison, verse 7. And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loose out of his prison. Verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast in a lake of fire and brimstone. And this is amazing, where the beast and the false prophet were. Are. This is the place you don't get out of. It's a place where God deals right, righteously and justly with sin. Now, I want to do that. Then now go and say something else about the cross. And what our Lord suffered in agony. For me and for you. And not only did he suffer in agony for you and I, but he took a death and a weight of sin on him that he hadn't earned and he didn't deserve. 
But God loved us that much. And the grace of God and the love of God is manifested at that cross. And the wrath of God is revealed and the justice of God is satisfied. And the grace of God is manifested for sinners like you and I. Does that touch your heart? That he loved us and gave himself for us. He loved me when I wasn't lovely. When I was rebellion, rebellious and defiant and didn't care anything about God. And all of us have wagged our hands. I'm among Christian folks, so I couldn't do what I thought. But <laughs> have wagged our hell. Some of y'all know what I was going to do. And said, leave us alone to the creator of heaven and earth. I've always thought people have to be insane to tell the creator of heaven and earth what to do. Yeah. You know, that's why I love that verse on Psalms 2. It says, the heathen sits in heaven shall laugh. The Lord has them in derision. But then it goes on to say, then he's going to speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know what? For time's sake. You all know the verse. So go over to Isaiah 50. On the cross of Calvary, the Lord suffers a death that's like the second death. I am so grateful that God Almighty gave his son to pay a debt that I couldn't pay for a sin, a debt that he didn't owe. To pay a penalty and a price for sin by smiting his only son. The Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ, this is my beloved son in whom I well please. Hebrew says he was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He never apologized to God. He never confessed to man. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. The second person of the Godhead came down and took on human flesh. To come and suffer a death so horrible that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit couldn't look upon him. So I'm going to say these verses so I can get to the part I want to get to. But over in Isaiah 53 where it says it pleased the Father to bruise him. It pleased the Father to bruise him. His soul was an offering for sin. And then the psalmist, when he cries on the cross in Matthew 27, he says, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And the forsaking of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is an issue of eternal judgment that people are forsaken forever. No mercy, no grace, no peace, no comfort, no love. Nothing but this wrath poured out upon wrath. And yet his sins are being placed on us. So God the Father smites him. And God the Holy Spirit and the Father forsake him. And yet the adversary is sitting there waiting. Because at the Lord's weakest moment, he was crucified in weakness. He's sitting there and, and the adversary is ready to tear him up and take the power that he had of death on those, those three hours on the cross and consume him. And the Lord goes there in his weakness. And so this verse in Isaiah chapter 50 That's why that verse over in Hebrew says, as much as the children were partakers in flesh and blood, him, he himself also took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. What you see on Calvary is the display of power. <laughs> you see the power of the adversary and the power of death, and you see the power of God, and you see power against power. And the Lord on that cross of Calvary has power that exceeds the power of the adversary, that he just wore himself out. Now, there's going to be a point in why I'm saying this to you, okay, how this is going to play out for the Gentiles in the dispensation of grace. When the Apostle Paul says, we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom that God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That information that God kept secret about his unprophesied program, about what that cross was really going to accomplish, it's not revealed until you get to Paul. You all know that. And you begin to see the unfolding of God's eternal purpose. 
and the matchless wisdom and the amazing grace of the God of all grace. Isaiah chapter 50. Here he is. Verse number 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, this is a prophecy the Lord is talking about. Isaiah is writing about the Lord. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He that is near, he is near that justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. When Satan, when the Lord invited him to come, that's why that verse in John says that, that the Lord Jesus Christ came to manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And on that cross of Calvary, folks, not only was he dying for our sins, not only was he forsaken by God, the Father, and God, the Holy Spirit, but we were in a predicament that the Lord had to go get us out of. And he can only do that through redemption. And he could do that for Israel, too, and get them out of the captivity of Satan that they willfully went in and that we were in because the Gentile nations. Come over to Romans chapter 1. The Gentile nations... We're given up by God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son because of the ungodliness of their thinking and their opposition against God the Father. That's why it says we were enemies of God. You know we were, don't you? You know we were, don't you? <laughs> we weren't his friends. Israel was, but not the Gentiles. And sometimes I'm not so sure, and maybe you do, but it's taken me a long time to appreciate the position we're in. I'm going to quote Ephesians chapter 2, and you have a quickened who were dead in what? Trespassing and sins. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of, according to the course of this world, according to, help me out, help me out with the bird. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Not only were we in that position because of Adam, but dispensationally, we were cut off. So remember that you've been in times past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision of the flesh, that at that time, we were our Christ, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Watch this part. Having no hope. Do you know what it means to have no hope? But that's not the only part without God in this world. So we were dead, not only in our trespass and sins, but we were dead in terms of being part of the nations. So when Paul begins to talk about the dispensation of the grace of God and the gospel of the grace of God, he starts with, listen to me, he starts with the wrath being delayed in the message of grace. He starts and goes back to show that God Almighty, when it was time, when the where sin abounded. That verse is not just talking about your, your sins. And it's true. There's not enough sin you can ever do that God's grace won't abound. But he's talking about when the time was right in the program and the prophetic calendar of God. When, when the world was right for judgment. When the world was right to be meted, fit for destruction. God stopped it. Suspended it. And listen to this. Grace be unto you. And peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a new official attitude of God towards the world today because of what his son did on Calvary. I got 14 minutes and 26 seconds. <laughs> I'm looking at this clock more. No, it ain't good. It's bad. Uh, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is real from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the, the, the truth and unrighteousness. As you go down through the passage, you see that God the Father gives the Gentiles up in verse 24, God the Son in verse number uh, 26, and God the Holy Spirit, and give them over to a reprobate mind. And then in chapter 2, when he begins, Paul begins to look at the issue of the execution of the eternal judgment, judgment of God, he says, verse number 5, verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against Gnosis, the day of wrath. That issue of hell is a continuation of the wrath of God revealed and ends up at the second death 
at the great white throne judgment in the lake of fire. Where death and hell is cast in the lake of fire, which is called the second death. It's the death of the soul. It's the death of eternal judgment. Now, I'm going to move quick. So I'm going to leave that part because I can't transition to get to our hope. Come over with me to Romans chapter 8. Folks, God only didn't just save enemies. The issue of being justified freely by his grace. In Romans, you have the doctrinal treaties of the issue of justification by faith alone. How God can take a dead, ungodly sinner and declare him righteous through the redemption of sin, Christ Jesus. Not only, did, not only take an enemy, but make you a son. Think about that. The Gentiles that were meted for destruction, the ones that had been given over to, to consign to Satan, the Lord went and not only did he get Israel out of predicament as the son of David, but he comes and gets us of our, our predicament as the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he, because of the new, the regeneration that we get because of our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only do we get saved or justified, then he makes us sons. Not just sons, full grown sons with all the rights and privileges of adoption. How did that happen? The enemies, now sons. And the edification process in the book of Romans is to teach us justification. We've been declared righteous. Our sanctification is true, so we begin to walk in this new identity. The identity we've been taken out of Adam, put in Christ, and now we have all these wonderful attributes of this one new man. And so as we begin to learn and understand that, now he says over there in Romans chapter 20, he wants us to walk in love. And they've talked about it all week to, to get busy about doing the Father's business. Don't be down here serving the world. I think I've heard Pastor Jordan saying that and other people that sin is a waste of time for the believer. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time to do anything outside of what the God the Father has given us to do. He's God our Father. He's not just God, the creator of heaven and earth. He's our Father. And then his Son is our Savior and our Lord. And now he's given the Holy Spirit to indwell us. So you get over to Romans chapter 8, and he starts talking about this issue of, folks, this is amazing to me. This is just amazing because I got 11 minutes, so I got to get to, let me just quote the verse. In Colossians, he says, he's translated out of us out of the kingdom of Satan into what? The kingdom of his dear son. And he's raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places. It's not just his death, burial, resurrection we've been identified with. It's his, it's his exaltation and enthronement for glory. The ones that were the enemies of God that weren't part of Israel's program, we're destined for eternal glory. Because of our Savior. Uh, First Timothy, Paul says, Christ is our hope. That's why we get all this, because of him. That's why everything is for Christ's sake. And the only thing God wants us to respond to on the basis of grace is a heart of love and gratitude to respond to all this information. It's not just there for your head. It's there for our heart. It's designed to transform us in the inner man. But your Christian life, as we've been taught, doesn't operate on the basis of ignorance. So I need, I need to get in the book and let the book get in me because it's the living God through his living word living in me Amen. to produce his life. Not my life. It's his life that's the issue. Amen. And God Almighty, not only is his son the beloved one, but we're called as sons of God today, our sonship status. We're called the sons of God, but we're said to be accepted in what? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm so glad that God Almighty doesn't deal with me on the basis of, of, of his justice. He dealt with his son. I'm so glad that God doesn't deal with me on the basis of a performance system. He deals with me on the basis of grace and my new identity in Christ. He just said, grow up, man. Get, up, get on with the show. <laughs> We're left here in a world that doesn't know what we know. A world of sin and darkness. Controlled by the prince of this world, the God of this world. We're supposed to shine forth as lights in the midst of a dark world. Amen. I don't really need an amen. I mean, I appreciate it, but this information should rejoice in your heart. Now, sometimes I will ask for an amen. So, amen? amen. <laughs> you got to have some fun up here, somebody said the other day. Verse number um, 
16, the spirit of the self bears, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. And he goes talking, talks about our suffering. Verse 18, that was dealt with last night by uh, Pastor Jordan. Verse number 22, for we know that the whole creation grown and travailing and pain together until now. Even we ourselves, and not only they, verse 23, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown with ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now, Paul doesn't deal with the advanced information about our sonship status in the book of Romans. He starts dealing with that in his latter epistles. So, but to get to the point to begin to appreciate who you really are in Christ, you have to grow in grace. Now, Come over to First Thessalonians, because I, I got seven minutes. And I'm kind of throwing verses out there. Uh, um, I share with my wife, and, and I, I share with some of the brothers, the, the challenge to me of preaching at the end of the week is every time somebody says something, I was adding to my notes. <laughs> but that wasn't the problem, is that I had too many notes and verses before I even got here. So I, I keep writing down stuff, and I, how do you condense this and revise it in a way that's clear and it makes sense, but it's designed to work in us effectually because that's what the doctrine's supposed to do. That is designed to motivate. This is to motivate us, folks. Have you gotten that's my message? That's my purpose? It's to motivate us? Uh, I was given a s- s- subject. It's, I'm sorry, Pastor. It's uh, the reality of heaven, hell, and the only hope available in Christ. It's bad enough he gives me subject, heaven, hell, and hope. Then he tells me, you got to get this out of there. So hopefully, you know, when I was taught to preach, is to inform, persuade, and motivate. My goal is to motivate us today. After all this doctrinal information we've heard all week long, that we go home and we're busy about the master's business. We don't get conformed to this world and get distracted by all this noise out here, because we can. Our Savior is in control, folks. That's why I read that verse over in Romans that the whole creation groaning and, and travails and pain together now. The purpose of God right now is to hold back his wrath and his long suffering. So we can go tell sinners about the wonderful grace of the God of all grace. Now this is the last passage, and I think I can finish with this. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse number one. Got one more after this, and now I got a summary. First Thessalonians five, but at the times and season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Um, we have the whole Bible when we study in light of Paul's epistles, but we believe and study the whole Bible. Amen. It will appear to me that Paul taught about times and seasons. That's not our program. That's Israel's program. And he would explain to those believers about the things we talked about today as well as the circumcision believers. So they would see that God was doing something that was unprophesied in the mystery program. It is really amazing sometimes that people can't see the distinctions between prophecy and mystery. And to know where to go to find our information so we can grow properly. And be able to study, like I said, get into your inner man life so it can live out of you. I can go tell my wife all this stuff and, and, and treat her in a way that's disrespectful and not gracious. That's not who I am. And that's Russell. That's not who I am in Christ. So the issue today is to see the doctrine live out of us so it can manifest my headship under the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's teaching doctrine to not only us, but those angelic beings to the intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And I, I love yesterday when um, Pastor Jordan talked about the three types of sufferings. The sufferings of this present time. We learn that so we don't get shaken when life shows up. We're not exempt because of God's holding back his wrath and us being in a program where he is long suffering towards the world. Then I like the one you said about the suffering. I call it for stupidity. Are you suffering for stupidity? Just still rebellious? 
not having a tender heart of love. That verse is still true. God resists the proud. He still gives grace to the humble. And the whole message, the, the issue of the message of grace is to conform us to the image of God's dear son. Not to be arrogant and proud, but to have the humility as we sit and wonder at our Savior and our Father's great love for us. But here's the one that a lot of times that I'm asking you to go out and do when we leave here. It's the sufferings of Christ. Mm. See, the sufferings of the present time, you just hear. Because we're born in a sin-cursed world. You can't get out of that one. The suffering for stupidity, you can get some help and stop doing that. <laughs> We've all done it. But you know the one that God Almighty that pleases him is that we choose to suffer with him, the sufferings of Christ. So you go out here, folks not going to be happy with you. When you start talking about the revelation of the righteous judgment of God against sin and their sinners. Um, we're in a time, obviously, that people have gotten away from light. But somebody said earlier this week, we don't know who will hear the word of God. We're, I call us seed planters. We plant, we water, who gives the increase? Somebody had to plant the word of God in my heart and give me the gospel. And that's why I say, no, we have family members. I'll tell my wife, I, I, I heard Oscar Woodall say this years ago, and it motivated me. Uh, Brother Woodall, if you never met him, was a wonderful brother who... When he found out about the grace measure, he and his wife, as I understand, went witness to all their family members on both sides of the family. So when I heard that over 30 some odd years ago, I went and spoke to all my family members who were living at that time about the issue of eternal judgment. Because I, I know it's real. I didn't want to see any family members go to hell. What's wrong with us when we sit there and look at these folks? We say we love them. That's not love. Do I have your attention? Okay, good. Verse number two. When they say, for yourselves know perfectly, that's maturity issue, they've been taught, that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the light. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brother, are not of the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor the darkness. We were. <laughs> we're not anymore. Therefore let us not sleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are the day be sober. Put on a breastplate of faith and love. For, and for a helmet of salvation. The hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to. Wrath, but to obtain salvation. We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. I got one more passage, and I'll stop. Go on to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 20 seconds. Folks, hell is a reality. But anybody listening to me, anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ and pardon all your sins, hell is avoidable. God's provided a way out through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know him today, would you trust him? Would you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself? Would you believe that God Almighty will give you a free gift of eternal life if you simply just trust his son? Because he did all the work necessary to reconcile me back to God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So in the book of Romans, he says, therefore being justified by faith. And I didn't get into the other passages because it talks about we rejoice today in the hope of the glory of God. But as sinners, we came short of the glory of God. Now we rejoice in anticipation that one day we're going to see him and he's going to change our vile bodies. It's going to be fast like his glorious body. And he's going to take us and he's going to subdue all things in the heavenly government where our citizenship is at. He's going to use us to bring under his authority, his kingship, his, his, he's called a blessed and only potentate. Oh, yeah, I know you had to push that thing. The king of kings and lord of lords. Who only has immortality dwelling in the light. Second Thessalonians, and I'm through with this. Pastor, I went over about one minute. Um, one of my favorite verses. I get to it. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about the hope. Now our Lord Jesus, verse 16. Second Thessalonians 2, 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father. What does it say there? Who have loved us and given us everlasting consolation and what? 
good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Father, we just thank you. We give you honor and glory because you're worthy. In Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen.